Good evening and welcome to the API's Iron Government program for Thursday, November the 4th, 2021. Iron Government brings you the latest on government's plans, programs, policies and projects. I am Barbara Dolver. Just ahead on this evening's program, we'll learn more about the work of two United Nations agencies. The API sat down with Dr. Erica Jordan, who stressed the need for early detection for breast cancer. Venezuelan diplomat Francisco Perez discussed with the API the significance of the relationship between SVG and Venezuela. These stories and more are just ahead, but first, let's join Ashisia Sam for Newswatch. Good evening and thank you very much for joining us for Newswatch for Thursday, November 4, 2021. I'm Ashisi Assam. Minister with Responsibility for Climate Change Related Matters, the Honorable Carlos James is leading a four-member delegation at the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference of the Parties COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland, as part of St. Vincent and the Grenadines' effort to strengthen the position of the Alliance of Small Island States. World leaders, negotiators, and international institutions converged at this climate change conference with the hope of agreeing on a comprehensive plan being drawn up to avert a global climate crisis. In what is being billed as the most important climate change meeting since the Paris Agreement and International Treaty on Climate Change agreed among world leaders at the UN Climate Conference in 2015, this year's conference aims to hold countries accountable to their commitment of sustainability, reducing global greenhouse gas emissions, and to provide financing to developing countries to mitigate climate change. Minister James said the summit represents an important call to action to hold developed countries accountable as the main contributors of greenhouse gas emission. The Sustainable Development Minister cautioned that if action is not taken now, small island developing states like St. Vincent and the Grenadines will become unrecognizable due to the severe impact of climate change. The other members of the delegation are Nyasha Hamilton, Environmental Resource Analyst, Edmund R. Jackson, Climate Change Advisor, and Janil Drayton, Councillor, Permanent Mission of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to the United Nations. Non-governmental organizations, community groups, and government agencies are invited to submit projects under UNESCO's participation program. UNESCO Secretary General in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Janiel Henry Rose, outlines some of the particulars for consideration. It's ongoing up until December. So the first week in January, we submit all of these projects to UNESCO. Individual projects under this particular one is forbidden. So I can send a project and say, I, I want a studio built at my home. That's out of it. But we can look at it with respect to the community of lauders needing, let us say, a library or a media room or whatever, a hub where students can go. We know we have online learning now where students can go and they can have their classes. For more information on the UNESCO Participation Program, contact the UNESCO Secretariat via email at unescosvg at gov.vc or unescosvg at gmail.com or give them a call at 451-2755. The University of the West Indies Open Campus launched Phase 1 of the Transcular Program for people from Spanish-speaking Caribbean countries. The program titled Integrating Cuba, the Caribbean and the European Union through Culture and Creativity is being implemented in collaboration with UNESCO Regional Office for Culture in Latin America and the Caribbean and funded by the European Union. 
Principal of the Open Campus, Dr. Francis Severin, said the partnership would further deepen regional integration in the Caribbean and is in sync with the UWI strategy goals of access, agility, and alignment. The Open Campus principal explained that the goal of access is met through the expansion of higher education and the training opportunities, which the Transcular program will provide for 480 participants. This includes 330 participants from the cultural and creative industries who will pursue a range of continuing and professional education courses, and 150 Cuban professors who will participate in blended teacher training for remote delivery. The St. Vincent and the Grenadines Community College, in collaboration with the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment, will host an on-campus vaccination drive on Friday, November 5, at its Villa campus. Director of the SVGCC, Nigel Scott, says the college recognizes the global challenges presented by COVID-19 and neither St. Vincent and the Grenadines nor the community college are exempt from these challenges, and they deem it important to host this activity. He says the college has a societal and institutional responsibility to actively combat the spread of COVID-19. Scott says scientific evidence shows that vaccines work and as an institution, deeply supportive of the science-based knowledge as evidenced by their expanding science department, they are offering their support by hosting this vaccination drive. The public is invited to attend the SVGCC on-campus vaccination event on Friday between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. Here's where we end News Watch for this evening. Do stay with us for the rest of our Eye on Government program. I'm Shisi Assam. Good evening. Here's what's coming up on Inside Story. All saints, all souls, grave lightings. Why do we practice these traditions? Is Sahara just posing a problem to you? Dr. Bonnady shares coping mechanisms. Get the full story on Inside Story this Saturday on SVG TV at 5 p.m. and on Monday at 8 p.m. on VC3. Save the day. Welcome back. You're watching the APIs and Government. The United Nations Regional Office paid a high honor to St. Vincent and the Grenadines when they included us in their UN Day celebrations. To mark this occasion, the API zoomed in on two agencies that work in this country. After we followed UN officials as they joined local partners in a tree planting ceremony at Rabaka. How do you feel to be working for such an institution that has a huge wingspan like the United Nations? Well, I think this is um, an honor, first, to have the opportunity to, to serve, um, to serve the global community and to serve, uh, in, in my case, the Eastern Caribbean countries. Um, that's a big challenge, always, especially when multilateralisms can be questioned sometimes, but I'm very proud to be able to work in the Eastern Caribbean, where the countries like St. Vincent and the Grenadines, like Barbados, like Antigua and Barbuda, like, like Dominica and many others, are so committed to multilateralisms. Uh, because that's also a question of survival for small states. That's how countries can have a say, they have an equal vote to big countries. Um, uh, and, and, and this is really the platform that makes more than ever a sense to achieve the sustainable development goals, to promote peace, and in this time of COVID pandemic, to be able to overcome this crisis. So I think we all feel proud of uh, belonging to the UN. And when I say all, it also means in Vincent and the Grenadines, because you're a member of the United Nations and the UN is the, is the home of everyone. The United Nations is even closer to us with the installation of a local coordinator. So that's why we have established an additional presence, physical presence here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines it's with uh, the establishment of a, of a, of a UN uh, coordination office, which is an extension of my office in Barbados covering the Eastern Caribbean, and uh, Ms. Lafleur Kwame. 
is our national officer, country coordination officer that is taking um, up this role um, and is part of uh, my team precisely to support on a day-to-day -day basis uh, the, the government of St. Vincent and the, and the country. In light of the commemoration of the United Nations Day, we turned our lenses on two individuals who hold portfolios with the United Nations and are doing work within this country. Jan? Yes. <laughs> Welcome to St. Vincent. Thank you. Uh, tell us first, what is the role of the IOM in general and why are you here? So IOM, International Organization for Migration, or often we go by UN Migration, is a global organization that is supporting governments and societies with uh, safe and orderly migration. Basically we believe is, if migration is being done in a safe way, it benefits everyone. Um, we're active also a lot in crisis areas, in, uh, in conflicts, but also in uh, natural disasters. Uh, because natural disasters and crises often bring displacement and that can be cross-border displacement or internal displacement like now after the volcanic eruption here in uh, St. Vincent. So we received some funding uh, here in St. Vincent. We're funded by the government of Japan um, and we to support the people with the displacement. So we specifically focus here on uh, emergency shelters uh, in the management of emergency shelters and also that the facilities are um, uh, providing dignified, uh, dignified and a safe space uh, for the people that are uh, displaced. You also mentioned that you had partners in Trinidad and you also have partners here. Yeah. So we have what, what we do and like a lot of our agencies do is you work with local partner organizations. They're on the ground. They know the country much better than we do. So always preferred modality to work together with partners. So when we were uh, our initial response um, that was in May, uh, we approached uh, and I was actually at that moment in Costa Rica. So I made some phone calls like who's active uh, that I knew and I knew ITNAC from, from Trinidad and uh, Tobago. Uh, I worked together with them uh, a few years ago in Dominica. So it's a trusted partner I said, hey, are, are you guys responding? And they said, yes, we're we're buying non-food items, hygiene kits, and we are, have a distribution network in St. Vincent. So I said, okay, can you do some more? And so they did, and they, uh, pro they uh, bought and procured quite a lot of um, uh, generators, power, power washers, uh, shovels, wheelbarrows, water tanks, uh, which all came by ship, and, uh, and, and, and actually a free ship uh, to, from Trinidad to and Tobago. They worked here with the Church of the Nazarene, uh, that was their partner, so we supported, we did our distribution through that network. Uh, another partner we worked with is uh, the uh, St. Vincent and Grenadines first responders. Um, we also provided them with some, uh, with some funding so they could mobilize uh, volunteers and equipment and trucking. And they uh, did quite some cleaning work, both on the leeward and the windward side uh, of some homes and, and yards. Um, so yeah, local partners is, 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 is the way to go. The UNESCO Secretariat, housed in the Ministry of Education, has a small staff but pushes a lot of work. Well, we registered with UNESCO on January 14, 1983, so that's close to 40 years now. But we didn't always have a physical presence. Actually, yes, we always had a a unit we always had a secretary general mm -hmm. there is the national commission there there has always been that but remember we said that getting the information out may have been an issue but with the digital age now mm -hmm. more information is reaching the public so maybe that's the difference who was in the position before you General. My predecessor was Miss Lafleur John. So, yes, Miss Lafleur John, and she demitted office sometime in 2009. So, I officially became the Secretary General in 2010. UNESCO is a body that has a lot of experts. And one thing for sure, they're going to jump in 
is with technical support with technical support we get a lot of financial support and so when the pandemic the COVID-19 pandemic hits us and when the Lasso Frey volcano erupted they jumped on board to assist and it happened in a number of ways first we knew that we had to go online and we 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 were a bit challenged with the technology and so forth so what happened we unesco itself gave assistance with respect to microsoft teams training and that training came not only for the children but for teachers and for parents just to add that this is ongoing we also had another training which we refer to as blackboard this came from the global coalition of education because unesco itself is not a funding agency we partner with a number of international bodies governments around the world ngos around the world who give us funding for particular purposes so we teamed up there the training for blackboard it was for teachers over 200 teachers in st vincent and the grenadines with the university of the west indies that's one of our partners the microsoft teams as you know those are the persons who develop the app they're the ones who are doing the training and um, not only that but we also have another program where we are thinking of the students who may not be ready or who we're doing an assessment of those students while on um online and who we think have not grasped what they're supposed to have so we're doing an assessment that's another program and try to develop ways in which we can assist these children to ensure that they reach a the threshold and to continue learning even after the COVID-19 pandemic. Whilst in the country, the UN resident coordinator, Trey Buke, joined the forestry department in the Ministry of Agriculture for a tree planting ceremony. The area, Tunnel Point, is located in the area of what was formerly the injector site for the geothermal project. The difference that I see today is that at least the landscape is green. And this is, compared to what I saw when I came here, a great sign of hope. Um, crops were destroyed, now crops are starting to produce again. And this effort through this tree planting ceremony is really about um, rebuilding further hope. Um, planting trees and, and, and the act of reforestation is of course critical to avoid further land degradation and prevent also additional lahars that can have a very dramatic impact, of course. Trebuke stated that the Lassofre volcano eruptions significantly impacted lives, infrastructure, and destroyed crops, hence the tree planting ceremony rebuilds hope. We are very pleased as UN system to have been able to contribute to this multifaceted humanitarian response and recovery with a funding appeal that was launched in April together with the, with the Prime Minister. We managed to, to raise about $11.5 million, uh, which is uh, a very successful exercise to catalyze international solidarity and this enable us to, to really support those extensive efforts that were put forward such as uh, with WFP 730 uh, million metric tons of humanitarian relief goods that were dispatched through five warehouse locations or the WFP providing and still providing uh, cash transfers uh, to a total accumulated of 3,500 households. Meanwhile, Minister of Agriculture, Honorable Saboto Caesar, said the celebration of UN Day comes at a time of overwhelming challenges in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and around the world. To the young people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the region and the world, those who have worked to keep the United Nations as a body together over the years, they're basically signing a will 
where we are going to be the recipients of years of hard and dedicated work. And uh, to our young people, we have to ensure that we build on this legacy. Deputy Prime Minister and Area Representative Honorable Montgomery Daniel described UN Day as a great day. Minister Daniel expressed happiness that Trebuk and his team visited St. Vincent and the Grenadines to celebrate UN Day. Forestry workers, I know you have a hard task ahead of you in ensuring the reforestation of this area. But I know you can do it. I've seen you done it before. And not only the mahogany and, 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 and the, the trees for, for, for um, furniture and so on that is being required, but you need a lot of fruit trees so that not only humans can partake, but also the, the animals that are around. The tree planting ceremony saw participation from other UN bodies in the country, including the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, United Nations Development Program, UNDP, International Organization for Migration, IOM, and Country Coordinator, Laflo Kwame. After the tree planting ceremony, Deputy Prime Minister and Area Representative, Honorable Montgomery Daniel, led the United Nations delegation on a tour of the Orange Hill Housing Project and marked for persons displaced in the aftermath of the April Lassafre volcano eruptions. Yeah. And, um, so you can more like this? Yes, we are going to do another 41. So the hall is getting 68. For the 68 person, we have to get relocated for it. <laughs> Reporting for Iron Government, I am... Keisha Woodley. Don't go away. Iron Government continues after the break. In this ongoing pandemic, we as a country are running the race of our lives. Do we beat COVID or does COVID beat us? And the talk of several ways of the virus to come, how do we ensure that we come out on top? That outcome will be determined by what we do. Do we take the vaccine and protect ourselves or do we gamble with the chance that COVID will not catch us? We are in the race of our lives and the goal is to win. As an athlete, I want to get to the finish line first. The question is, do we beat COVID-19 or do we allow it to beat us? Welcome back. The COVID-19 pandemic and the volcanic eruption of April 9th not only disrupted lives and livelihoods, but created several difficulties in education. Many of these challenges were highlighted as the SVG National Accreditation Board hosted its annual Canquate Conference. The API's Inga Jackson has more. Lack of training among some teachers to facilitate online teaching was among several difficulties highlighted by Chair of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Accreditation Board, Dr. Rosalind Ambrose, that affected the education sector during the COVID-19 pandemic and the eruption of the Lassafre volcano. 
Addressing the annual Cancate Conference recently, Dr. Ambrose said that despite the many challenges, teachers were still able to get the job done. COVID-19 can be identified as a global force majeure these times, but St. Vincent and the Grenadines had the added challenge of a distinct force of nature in the form of the multiple explosive eruptions of the Lasso Freire volcano in April of this year. And with that, everything was 100% disrupted. Our physical schools were reassigned the new duty of becoming emergency shelters, as our education systems were doubly interrupted with the bad timing of being just one to two months before major regional examinations. I think if nothing else, the impact of this unworthy couple created a great disarray in many systems and certainly in the realm of education. The pandemic had already jettisoned many educators into new technological arenas, demanded ICT literacy, brought new responsibilities and thrusted many into new realities of self-development. Teachers, students and parents were literally stuffed into a new wormhole in the digital world. Our students who were expecting to join the international student community were literally marooned here because as the world has become increasingly interconnected, so are the risks we all face because the pandemic had not stopped at national borders. Students at every level were made to cope with continuing their education in circumstances where physical, socioeconomical, technological limitations became magnified and much of our population had to cope with that. Online teaching is a whole new game with different set of rules of engagement for students and for teachers. And most teachers were not fully nor formally trained, but they were made to literally lean into it hard, becoming resourceful, creative, and had to do so very quickly. The resulting learning loss will lead to skill loss and the skills people have relate to their productivity. UNESCO claims that one year into the pandemic, close to half of the world's students are still affected by partial or full school closures. Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Education, Mika Burke, emphasized the support Kankate has given to St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Accreditation Board. Burke also mentioned the effects that the COVID-19 pandemic had on the annual Kankate Conference for 2020 and which forced them to adopt a virtual platform for 2021. Several committees were established. Trinity Medical Sciences University was provided venue and technical support. The Ministry of Education had committed its unwavering support Senior and technical civil servants invested considerable amount of time in preparation for this conference. A special note must be made, a special mention must be made for the work of our former SEO accreditation, Mrs. Hamilton. Unfortunately, this was not to be. The COVID 19 pandemic forced postponement of the in-person meeting resulting in adoption of this online modality. An online modality now considered the norm of today. The pandemic continues to impact us in unimaginable ways. We are more and more finding that we have to reposition ourselves so that we do not lose focus of our mandates relates to our work in quality assurance, we recognize that standards should be, should not be compromised. This conference provides a forum to examine the response both globally and regionally to the unforeseen threats to higher education, particularly the COVID-19 pandemic. In SVG, we have also been specifically impacted by natural disasters more significantly by loss of air, volcanic eruption. But we recognize amidst our challenges, 
opportunities arose. Opportunities to learn, opportunities to evolve, opportunities to retool, to evolve, demonstrating a resilience that is typical of people of the Caribbean. Job losses and chips in market priorities have brought to the fore the need for retooling the workforce so that these skills possessed are relevant and potential employees are marketable. This means that training opportunities and modalities which may emerge must be monitored for quality. I challenge participants over this two-day conference to reflect on the changing demands in higher education the attendant responses. Coming out of this conference, we should be better placed to position ourselves and our organizations to offer tangible solutions. Feature speaker at the 2021 Cancate Conference, Pro Vice Chancellor and Chair of the Board for Undergraduate Studies at the University of the West Indies, UWE, Vincent Schomborn, Professor Justin Robertson, reiterate the effect of force majeure on higher education here in the region and globally. Force majeure is where unforeseen circumstances prevent something from happening. So force majeure events abound in our neighborhood. And St. Vincent is an interesting place where we've just gone through the pandemic, volcanic eruption. I have all my windows closed to the hair in Barbados because we're experiencing ash from africa we are in many cases islands so, so so global supply chains can impact on us so we live in a beautiful but dangerous neighborhood and force majeure events abound and we need to keep an eye on those i also think that in many of our small island developing states with our horrible legacies of colonialism and slavery many persons remain marginalized and locked into vicious cycles of poverty and violence. And as we deal with force majeure events and the impact on quality, one of the critical responses I would argue is for us to maintain our sense of mission. Why is it important to maintain high standards of quality in the face of more force majeure events. And I argue that the fact that in our small island developing states, with our horrible legacies of colonialism and slavery, where many remain marginalized and locked into these vicious cycles and poverty, the capacity for higher ed, for high quality, higher education to change lives is especially pertinent in Caribbean societies and in many parts of the world. And as we grapple with the, the challenges to our quality assurance systems from force majeure events such as hurricanes, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, which is front of mind, maintaining that sense of mission and the absolute need to maintain both the reality and the appearance of the highest quality standards is something we must keep front of mind. The St. Vincent and Grenadines National Accreditation Board, NAB, in collaboration with the Accreditation Council of Trinidad and Tobago, ACTT, hosted the 17th Annual Cancade Conference from the 28th to the 29th of October 2021. Cancade is a professional body established as a regional sub-network of the International Network for Quality Assurance Agencies in Higher Education. This year's conference was held under the theme Quality Standards and the Global Higher Education Market in response to force majeure. For the API's Iron Government, I am Inga Jackson. The hurricane season is upon us, and as we know, hurricanes can be dangerous. Listening to the hurricane warning messages and planning ahead can reduce the chances of injury or major property damage. Before a storm or hurricane hits, get to know your emergency shelters. Contact Nemo for the closest shelter to you. Have disaster supplies on hand, flashlight and extra batteries, portable battery-operated radio and extra batteries. 
first aid kit, non-perishable canned food and water, non-electric can opener, essential medicines, cash and credit cards, and sturdy shoes and raincoats. Where possible, apply hurricane roof straps. Review your insurance policy and ensure you have adequate coverage. Do not take chances with your life and property. Be hurricane ready today. Welcome back. When it comes to solidarity, friendship, and brotherhood, the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela has been the very embodiment of these ideals. Through the many programs and projects that this nation has funded and implemented, even in the face of their own trials, they have proven not just to be only reliable but dependable. On October 29, 2021, our nation celebrated 40 years of unity. In this segment, the API's Hall John sits down with Venezuelan diplomat Francisco Perez to discuss this milestone. Right on the heels of the celebration of our 42nd anniversary of independence, we are here at the Embassy of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela to commemorate a very wonderful milestone of solidarity between the nation of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela and St. Vincent. With me is Head of Mission of the Embassy of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, mm -hmm. Francesco Perez. Welcome, Mr. Perez. Thank you very much. And let me say welcome you uh, to this uh, piece of uh, Venezuelan land. Even that you are in, a, in your country now, because uh, it's the embassy of our um, country, you are in a piece of Venezuela in, in this moment. So uh, welcome to my country. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't think of it like that, and it is a beautiful part of your country. Yes. So we're de here to discuss our ongoing friendship, and a lot of people might not even know that we've established these relations for 40 years. Yes, yes. Well, before uh, the, the 1981, uh, even in the 20th centuries and, 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 and the 19th centuries, uh, Venezuela keep relationship with the England. The, the, uh, so all the um, uh, land that the England have, all the colonized countries that uh, England, uh, the British uh, uh, king have, Venezuela keep relationship with them. Because remember also that uh, Venezuela was colonized by Spain. Right. So they keep uh, the, the relationship. Uh, but in, in 80s uh, or in 90s, uh, in the 20th century, um, Venezuela keep relationship with St. Vincent, uh, with some consular that, uh, honorary consular is uh, right. what, what uh, right. exists in that moment. No, they don't send some uh, Venezuelan, special Venezuela to, to do that, but have somebody here that represent uh, the interests of, of uh, Venezuela. Uh, but formally, after two years after uh, the independence of, uh, of St. Vincent, uh, in 1981, uh, the president at the moment, um, Luis Herrera Camping, uh, established uh, and signed the, the, the agreement to establish embassies in each country. Uh, but it's not until uh, 2001 when the Conrad Ralph won the election that the Commander Chavez established the Brotherhood with right. the Commander Chavez, with uh, right. the, 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 the Conrad Ralph. So uh, they, uh, from that time in, in 2001, uh, Commander Chavez and Ralph Gonzalez keep uh, a very close relationship and uh, well Venezuela and the people of Venezuela start uh, you know assisting or um, in any any occasion that uh, the Conrad Ralph needed uh, from uh, uh, the service of, of something from Venezuela Commander Chavez was there and also and in every time that the, the Commander Chavez needed the assistance of, uh, of uh, Comrade Ralph and the people of St. Vincent, we, uh, the, the people of St. Vincent were there to assist us. So that is not just a friendship, it's a brotherhood that we build to collaborate, to complement 
uh, uh, to do the complementation, uh, complement, uh, is that the word? Yes, yeah? this is definitely <laughs> the word. Uh, to complement uh, each other, no? Uh, yes. Not just in a, in a business, but in social, sport, education, in, in different areas, different yes. areas. And uh, we are very proud of uh, keep that relationship and to we are pr very proud and we will uh, increase that relationship, increase all our uh, uh, different uh, agreement uh, and of course the uh, uh, the assistant and and the you know this something that you feel. You Definitely. feel uh, the culture. We we are we are tied with the same culture. So forty years, we look back, we see a tremendous friendship. We've seen so many collaborations. We've seen so many pr uh, um, programs and 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 other things coming out of our friendship. Where did we go from here? Well, uh, first that I have to say that. Um, Unfortunately, due to the, the the COVID, we can we couldn't celebrate in a right. better in another right. way the, the, the our our uh, anniversary uh, of relationship. Um, what we uh, try to do uh, in this week uh, is to post. We will use the social media the uh, to to post uh, different. Uh, the expression of if the, of our cultures, no? Right. Uh, in the music expression, we talked to um, the minister of culture in Venezuela, and uh, we are going to sign uh, next week, maybe, uh, a project to uh, record uh, with a Venezuelan uh, or typical orchestra uh, music from San Vincent. Uh, okay. We we already have everything. We have to sign and work on that. Uh, it's something that maybe uh, six or eight uh, songs that can be uh, recorded uh, with our orchestra to give to the people of of uh, San Vincent. No. Wow. And what we did uh, uh, the past uh, week was to record Vincentian artists recording and playing Venezuelan music and that is a gift that we are going to 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 post in our in our social media uh, also uh, well uh, we are working in the in the different agreement that uh, we have with uh, the government uh, and uh, we are going to extend that that agreement uh, we are going to to do a good, a deep re a review of, uh, of the agreement and uh, see if we are, well, you know, we Meeting can targets yeah, and, 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 yeah. and amplify or and, right. and, and, uh, that, that kind of, of, of job. But also, uh, well, in our situation, we can now uh, contribute more with, with St. Vincent, uh, but we are working in the complementary uh, uh, job. Areas, yes, yeah. uh, in the agriculture area uh, and the fishing, we we are working with the minister Saboto uh, in different uh, agreement. Uh, you know, to uh, bring fish, seed, or another stuff uh, to 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 San Vincent and to take maybe production to to Venezuela. No, right. Uh, that is something that we are. We have to to complete. We were we were working, and I think we will start working again in the uh, direct flight to Venezuela uh, right. from San Vincent. Right. Uh, right. In the way to improve the the tourism for each country, right. both country, no. Right. Uh, that is something of our some of our our plan, and you know, uh, our goal is to. Uh, Convert the the brotherhood in. I don't I don't like to say the marriage, but <laughs> <laughs> but because we are brother and sister, right, but right. Uh, it's something like that. No, yeah. a, a, a yeah. very very uh, close, close yeah relationship. Yeah, uh, and exactly. Yes, exactly. definitely. It's a and assist in every in every uh, thing. Uh, you know the the communication between uh, the government of San Vincent and the government of Venezuela is direct. They don't pass for for you know uh, uh, 
protocol or something. No, 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 no. Prime Minister need a call with President Maduro. <laughs> they right. communicate. And right. it's, it's something very... It's, it's the, 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 what we call the, diploma, the Bolivarian diplomacy of the peace. Yeah. It's the, the, peace, the, the diplomacy of the peoples of, uh, that, that we, we are practicing now. No? Uh, and uh, that is something that uh, Commander Chavez uh, established in, in, as a, as a, as a uh, the, 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 the leader uh, that direct the policies, the international policies of, of, of our country. Like the, the, the prime minister here uh, is the person that directs the, the international policy in Venezuela, the same. So uh, that is something that we are going to keep doing. Uh, I appreciate so much that the people uh, of uh, St. Vincent uh, accept me here and, and the job that we are doing uh, to uh, uh, in some way alleviate the, the, the different situation that have St. Vincent and uh, we appreciate so much the job that the government and the people of St. Vincent are doing to alleviate our, our problem in right. Venezuela. That right. sounds in good. Thank you very much. Up next, Dr. Erica Jordan discussed several issues related to breast cancer. Here's what's coming up on Inside Story. All saints, all souls, grave lightings. Why do we practice these traditions? Is Sahara dust posing a problem to you? Dr. Bonnady shares coping mechanisms. Get the full story on Inside Story this Saturday on SVG TV at 5 p.m. and on Monday at 8 p.m. on VC3. Save the day. Welcome back. A diagnosis of breast cancer is one of the biggest fears for women, not only in SVG but throughout the world. This week on our program, Dr. Erica Jordan, general surgeon at the Milton Keto Memorial Hospital, cleared some doubts that cause women to fear and remind us that early diagnosis is the best weapon to beat breast cancer. Dr. Jordan, welcome to our program and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me today. First of all, I want you to just tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Well, good afternoon, listeners. My name is Erica Jordan, 36-year-old general surgeon employed at the Milton Keto Memorial Hospital. Tell us, what is breast cancer? Now, breast cancer is a malignant disease that affects the breast tissue. It occurs in men and females, but females have a 100% chance more likely to develop breast cancer than males. As it relates to breast cancer, breast cancer is actually the leading cause of cancer death in women worldwide. And here in St. Vincent, we share the same statistics is the leading cause of cancer death in females in St. Vincent. And one of the main reasons for that is late detection leading to poor prognosis. Okay, could you tell us what are some of these signs and symptoms that would let women or men know that they might be struggling with? Breast cancer is one of the slowest growing breast cancer, slowest growing cancers in the world. And a lot of people assume that you have pain and discomfort with other cancers, but these are not the early warning signs. Early warning signs of breast cancer include changes in the skin, as in dimpling in the skin, retraction of the nipples, bloody discharge from one particular breast duct, an axillary lump, ulcerations in the skin, or an actual breast lump. Those are the main early warning signs of breast cancer. Could you provide some guidance for us on breast cancer screening? When to start, how often we should get checked? Okay, now breast cancer screening is mainly divided into three main areas. There's a self breast examination, which is the examination that women perform on their own breasts, where they get to know their breasts. And this is an examination that you perform monthly typically after the menstrual cycle. It is recommended that females after 20 years old start doing their monthly breast examinations. However, I recommend females as long as 13, 14, as soon as they hit puberty and they start to develop breast tissue, that they get to know their breasts. After the clinical breast examinations come, sorry, after the self breast examinations comes the clinical screening. And that is the breast examination that is performed by a trained professional. 
from 20 to 40 years, we do this every three years. And after 40 years, or if you have a history of breast cancer, we do this yearly. Now, a more in-depth screening process will be the, ultras the mammograms and ultrasounds. Mammograms, why? Because mammograms typically pick up breast cancer one to two years before there is a palpable lump. And your mammograms are done a yearly after 40 years old, unless you have a family history of breast cancer that would suggest that you start earlier. Are there any other diagnostic tests that can be done or earlier tests that can be done to detect whether or not you might have breast cancer or even if it's in the cell? Now, there are a range of things that can be done with breast cancer, not only to detect, but also to let you know if you have a greater probability of being affected by breast cancer. There are gene studies that will let you know if you have the genes that make you 85% more likely to have breast cancer. There are ultrasounds that we do in younger females with denser breast tissue because all females are not adequate candidates for mammograms, depending on the age of life. When you have younger females with really dense breasts, we recommend using the ultrasound. Later on in life, as the breasts become, you know, a little less dense, we prefer the mammogram. But there are a range of studies. You have the CT scan, you have the thermography studies, and these all help us pick up early stage breast cancer. I want us to go back a bit because you mentioned um, women should get tested if they have a history of breast cancer. So just for this, so that the public will know, is breast cancer hereditary? No. There are three main forms or groupings of breast cancer. There's this sporadic breast cancer that you just pick that up generally in females that really don't have a history. There's familiar where you can see in a few family members of the person but then there's a the hereditary breast cancer and that is the one that is linked to the gene that i was mentioning the breast cancer gene where you find in successive generations you have female members and maybe male members of the family being presented with breast cancer and you will find that they typically present at a younger age in each successive generation so you will find your grandmother had breast cancer at 70 your mother may have had it at 60. You may have had an aunt that had it at 50. And you as an individual may present at 40 years old. Because with each successive generation, you tend to present around 10 years earlier. That is why I was making the point that you start screening your mammograms at 40 years. Or if you have a known history of breast cancer, we will start earlier. Because we start 10 years before the youngest family member in your family would have presented. What happens if a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer? What are they, what should they expect? Now the treatment of breast cancer depends on the type of cancer and also the staging of the cancer. Really, we start by the size of the tumor. If it's a small tumor, and it is an introductal tumor because it can be from the breast parenchyma or it can be inside of the ducts. The treatment varies from just a simple lumpectomy or wide excision. That's to take the area that has the cancerous tissues with uh, the surrounding cells with healthy mar margins, or it may actually range to a complete mastectomy where we take off all of your breast tissue. But when you do a complete mastectomy, now with advancing medical practices, we recommend and we suggest that females actually now can do the mastectomy and reconstructive surgery because our breasts are a symbol of our femininity. And that is what I find a lot of my patients fear, that they will lose their breasts, they lose a part of their femininity, but this is not necessarily as is because there are options. There are options as long as you get an early diagnosis because that leads to a favorable prognosis. Because if you come in too late, there's not much that can be done. I want to talk about two things that you mentioned, reconstructive mm -hmm. surgery mm -hmm. and the breast as being, you know, a part of the female identity. So first of all, reconstructive surgery, what does this involve and who would be viable candidates for reconstructive surgery? Now, 
Virtually any female that we have done a mastectomy on is a candidate for reconstructive surgery. That is basically to put in a breast implant to simulate the opposite breast tissue mm -hmm. so that aesthetically they remain, you know, feminine. For women, since mm -hmm. femininity is important, um, and this aspect, is it usually discussed with women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer? Yes. Now, the typical approach to cancer is not just to diagnose and to cut. When we have a patient that comes in with a breast cancer, I prefer a multidisciplined approach. What does that mean? that you get the oncologist involved to make sure that the approach that you're taking surgically is the best plan for that patient. Also, we involve the psychologist, this clinical psychologist with the patient and their family members, because especially if you are doing your mastectomy, you have to be prepared for what this means for you as an individual, as a family, because the surgery is the beginning of the fight against cancer. It doesn't mean that it ends there. So we try to prepare our patients as best as possible. And that really leads to a better outcome. And you know that they accept the whole ordeal even better. Does treatment for breast cancer affect fertility in women? Breast cancer is linked to the female sexual hormones. So yes. It will affect your fertility in that after you have breast cancer and we do the surgery or we take a biopsy we do something called immunohistochemistry studies and these studies let us know if your cancer is hormone receptive or not if it's sensitive to the female hormones and if it is sensitive to the female hormones we give you treatments that depress those hormones in your system and that will affect your fertility. Could you address for us the issue of risk factors for cancer because we have heard before that sometimes oral contraceptives have been linked to breast cancer whether this is true or not. Could you address this? Now within the risk factors for breast cancer there are major and there are minor risk factors. Major breast risk factors will be like your family history of breast cancer. If you have certain gene mutations, if you actually have the breast cancer gene, if you have other illnesses like other cancers in other areas of the body or family history of other cancers. Within the minor risk factors, it will be like age, sex, weight and the use of oral contraceptive pills actually suppress your hormones while you're taking them. So it actually has a protective measure against breast cancer. However, I must mention that although it may protect you or give you a certain measure of, you know, shielding against breast cancer, it is also linked to increased risk of other cancers. So before you go to take any you know, oral contraceptive, any contraceptive measures. You discuss this with your doctor, you discuss this with your physician to see if this is best for you. Okay, before we, we wrap up, Dr. Jordan, do you have any advice for women? This is a topic that I feel very close to, very at heart, because I have seen several young females go through very invasive surgeries that could have been prevented with earlier diagnosis. Breast cancer is there, breast cancer exists, but it's not a taboo. Get to know your family history, get to know your breasts, get to know the warning signs of breast cancer. Do adequate screening and always, always seek help early. And I believe that we can win the war that is raging against this disease. Dr. Jordan, thank you so much for joining us today. It was indeed my pleasure. And that's how we end the APIs and Government. Thank you for viewing. If you've missed any of our past programs, you can catch these on our YouTube or Facebook pages at API, the Agency for Public Information, St. Vincent and Grenadines. Until next time, I am Bavin Olver. Good night.